Hi everyone, welcome to the first of our Flashmasters interviews and what a way to start because in this video I'm going to be talking to Flashmasters ambassadors Jesse and Moira LaPlante who are quite simply two of the best wedding photographers in the world. I have loved their work for years and as you can see here their work is absolutely incredible so it's a massive honour to have them both join us today. When we set up Flashmasters, we promise that education will be at the heart of everything that we do and there is no better way to start this than this video because as you will see, Jesse and Mora not only tell us exactly how they created these stunning images but they also share so much invaluable advice based around the business of wedding photography. The vast majority of our conversation is completely free to watch on YouTube, but if you are watching this video in the Flashmasters member zone, you will get the full length version in which Jesse and Moira share exactly how they created these incredible images. So welcome to Jesse and Moira and to everybody watching, welcome to Flashmasters. So I am so excited to welcome for the very, very first Flashmasters interview, two of the very best off-camera flash wedding photographers in the world, Jesse and Maura LaPlante. I love your work. I've admired you for a long, long time. And it is a real honor to have you join us, not only on, on uh, this interview, but also as part of the Flashmasters team. So firstly, on behalf of myself and Helen, a massive thank you for joining the team. And yeah, coming with us on this journey. We're very, very excited. Oh, thanks to you too, Neil. Uh, I mean, I've always looked up to you and your work too. So it's an honor for me personally to be here. And I know Maura probably yeah. feels the same way. Oh, that's very, very kind. Thank you. Well, as I say, like I have admired your work from, a, we've, unfortunately, we've never met in person, but I've admired your work from afar for a very, very long time. In particular, your off-camera flash work. So obviously that's what we'll be talking a little bit more about in this interview. But for now, can I just ask, it's a very boring question, but just how you both got into wedding photography? Because I always find that nobody at school or nobody growing up as a child thinks, I want to be a wedding photographer. So it's always quite useful to find out how everybody got into it. Yeah, uh, my parents are both artists, uh, and I grew up kind of traveling around the country uh, to music festivals and art fairs and and things like that, and always um, kind of had an inkling that I would grow up to do something creative for a living because I was exposed to so many different uh, artistic mediums from a very young age. Uh, I went to college for uh, journalism with a concentration in photojournalism, so I started out as a newspaper photographer, which was uh, a really fun time in my life and I got to shoot all sorts of different every day was a new challenge and a new um, a new sort of creative challenge and opportunity uh, but at a certain point around 2007 2008 the uh, print journalism industry kind of tanked <laughs> and it became very difficult to uh, make a living uh, as a as a newspaper photographer so I had to find other streams of revenue um, and a lot of people would tell me, like, you should you know, look into shooting weddings for a living because there's a lot of money in the wedding industry. You can make a good living. Um, and I would always reply with some variation of I will never be a wedding photographer <laughs> because at the, at the time, uh, bear with me, at the time, all the wedding photography I'd seen up to that point in my life was very kind of boring and homogenous. Uh, it was no flash work really, or it looked like very, you know, studio stuff like grip and grins, blown out backgrounds, kind of washed out filters. Um, and I just, for me at the time, that was like the lowest form. I didn't want to lower myself to that. Right. And I thought, I was gonna say, if, especially coming from the background that you've come from, which he's seen as being like real photography, I would right? say. So it, it probably feels like you're going to lose respect from the photography world. I imagine it's 100% it felt very contrived. And, uh, I thought that if I were to shoot weddings, that would be the style that would be expected of me. Um, mm -hmm. Ben Moore and I met. You want to tell a story? Yeah. Okay. Um, we'll make it quick. <laughs> so no, met, no, this is really interesting. Everyone will all want to find this out. <laughs> we met, um, so at the time I was going to, to school in D.C. He was in Michigan, um, but we actually met in the Bahamas on spring break our senior year of college, which is precisely where everyone goes for a long-term relationship. Um, but we exchanged numbers and email addresses and just kind of kept in touch and uh, decided like, hey, let's see how long this is fun. And I would say that I'm personally still having fun. So here we are 15 years later. 
um, it cracked me up because we were uh, we were at a bar. Um, there was a little bit of alcohol involved. Um, yeah, yeah, often yeah, the just way. Just a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> Not a lot. Yeah. Tiny, um, tiny it helps, bit. doesn't it? It helps. It does. And he, <laughs> a bit uh, of courage. he offered to buy me a drink. And I was like, this is funny because we're at an all inclusive resort. So, like, he's got a sense of humor. I want to talk to him. Well, a I'm more. frugal. You know, <laughs> if I can buy a free drink, then we're all set. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. And we moved to Colorado together about a year after that. Um, and started our wedding photography business, just like I said, I never would, but it was, we looked at it just as a way to sort of pay the bills in the interim until we found something more fulfilling to do. I, I'm with you. So you'd never had to shot a wedding on your own, Jesse. You did, you've always been a partnership. Yes. Yeah. yeah from day one. I've yeah. only mm -hmm. out of however many wedding, hundreds of weddings that we've done, I've only ever shot one wedding without Moira. Yeah. Oh. It was because my brother was getting married. Yeah. And so I wanted to attend that one. But yeah, I guess that this would be a good time to jump in with my background, which has nothing to do with photography. Um, I was born and raised in Montana and my parents uh, owned a restaurant slash bar slash casino. So it was a very interesting upbringing, just being around that as a child and, and really watching my parents um, as they ran their own business and like interacted with their clients, their customers, their uh, suppliers, their employees. Um, and then I, I thought that I was a big city girl. So I went to DC for college and after, um, you know, so I, I went to school for four years, lived there for a year and worked there and realized that I'm not a big city girl. I miss the mountains. Um, and so that was a little bit of the impetus of moving back out West to, to Colorado. Um, but my background, I studied business because I had no idea what I wanted to do. And I was like, well, I feel like a business degree will probably help me no matter what I do, if I understand accounting and finance and marketing. And um, so I, I had a full-time job up until what, like 2016. And um, then, you know, we just got too busy. And so I, uh, I had been dragged kicking and screaming into wedding photography a little bit, like the very first wedding that we did. Um, I have a background in events and he passed me a camera. I was like, can you come help out? But also here's a camera to take photos. And I had no idea what I was doing. And I, I would say it probably took about three years before you even delivered a single image of mine. <laughs> oh, if you mention any better, I think most of us, I think I felt the same. Although I was delivering them, I didn't really know what I was doing either. So, so don't worry. <laughs> it does. Yeah, no, that makes me feel better. But yeah, um, so everything I know about photography, I learned from him. Um, oh. and I don't know. But like, I'm sure I, you complement each other because your business background must be really, really useful. Obviously, mm -hmm. you know, because... Wedding photography is very much a business, isn't it? And and it's all very well being an amazing photographer, but if you don't understand the marketing side and the business side, then you're not going to get any far, which I always think is unfortunate, but the truth. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, we would not be in business still if it wasn't, if it was up to me to run the business and take photos, we would have been dead in the water years ago. Yeah, sure. and that's really nice how you clearly complement each other. It's almost like the perfect mix. Yeah. Yeah, no. I, and I it wasn't it's... until, you know, she shot working a full job with me for, five, six years. And it wasn't until she quit her full job and started working on the business full time uh, that we really kind of took off and, and started, you know, making money and, and being able to live the lifestyle that we want to live. And also the quality of work went up then too, because we could, I could devote more of my mental bandwidth to being creative instead of, you know, dealing with clients and booking and taxes and insurance and all the other 17 hats you have to wear. So if you could just expand a little bit on that, and we're just going to talk before we get on to onto the flash stuff um, about your approach, because I, I think I'm right in saying that it's not all about flash for you, is it? When you t actually come to tell the story of a wedding, like how, how do you actually go about approaching telling the story of a wedding day? Yeah, very similar to how I used to shoot assignments for newspapers in which mm -hmm. you couldn't you couldn't control anything, right? You yeah, couldn't tell yeah. anybody to move. Excuse me, sir, could you do that again? Could you slide this way? That's yeah, yeah. <laughs> unethical yeah. in the journalism industry. Um, so I'd say 90% of the wedding day, that's kind of how we shoot it. We don't really control anything. Uh, we're not doing a lot of grip and grins. We're not doing a lot of detail photos of centerpieces and things like that. We're just kind of going in and documenting the day as it unfolds and trying trying to be a fly on the wall and not allow our presence there to affect what's happening. I think that's really how you get the most um, impactful and poignant moments in emotion is when people sort of become used to you there and they're not a, they're not looking to you for direction, right? Uh, the other 10% of that day is 
portraiture in uh, times where we're trying to get a little more creative aesthetically. It's not quite as much about the emotion in the moments. It's more about what we're doing with composition and lighting and, and all those things. So that's the, the couple's portraits and, um, and occasionally, you know, the wedding party portraits and all those sorts of things. Um, we do use flash for a lot of that, uh, the candid stuff, um, just the same way that I did uh, for newspapers, where if I was shooting high school sports, basketball or something, I would set up flashes in the in the stands pointing. So we're still lighting a lot of that journalistic, the journalistic times, you know, from dance party to getting ready. We're still trying to be creative with composition and flash. It's just that the the creativity and the aesthetic is secondary to capturing the emotion. So if ever we feel as if it's getting in the way or, oh shoot, that battery's dying and what's, what channel is this on? If we, if we realize that we're missing moments because we're tinkering with, our, with the technology, then we'll sort of back off and just use the natural light. Um, so goal number one is capturing the moments, the journalism, telling the, uh, the true story of the day. Uh, secondary goal is being creative with lighting, but it, it is very important uh, to us because the, the creative uh, lighting shots and the portraitures and the portraits are, um, they tend to be the shots that attract new clients to us, right? Yeah, the moments are, are really important for the couple whose wedding we're shooting, uh, but for future clients, it's really the creative lighting stuff and the portraits and um, you know, the landscapes with the small couple and like the really dynamic uh, kind of contrast and lighting. Those are the photos that tend to attract uh, future clients. For yeah, us. I think it's exactly the same for me as well. And I think that's really good advice because I think moment photography really, I think is, is the, they are the images that are going to last the test of time. And I think they're the images that couples will look, be, be looking back on in 20 years, in 30 years. And those shots only increase in value, I think, as, as time goes on. Whereas that, you know, the creative portraits are very much maybe for the now, but like you say, it's very difficult, I think, to build a business and gain real traction in the industry, purely showing moments. Because it, like you say, it's only, they tend to be of most interest to the actual couple within those shots rather than, gaining interest out, outside where I think the portraits in particular the off-camera portraits really do do that um so from a business point of view I always think it's I have a similar approach to yourselves in that it's, it's those shots which sort of really stand out and will maybe get people interested in your work in the first place yeah no the, the portraits definitely reel people in mm -hmm. but I think it's, it's the moments that that keep them there and make them really value it like you mentioned but I, I would also say that Stylistically, the off-camera flash also informs how we shoot um, documentarily, where we look for the light, the natural light, the ambient light in places that we would put it if we were using off-camera flash. So we're always looking for that interesting light, um, but in, in having that basis in off-camera flash and using that in the portraits, it makes it much easier and quicker for us to see it than in, you know, like the day-to-day the -day life. Yeah, that's that's really interesting, actually. And it makes a lot of sense. And it also makes us also a bit easier as well, because you're always looking at like consistently, whether it's actually there naturally or not, you can, you can introduce it. Just building on from that, what point did you actually first started start using off camera flash in your work? Again, is that something you, you worked from, from from the beginning? Or was that something you introduced as, as, as you got more experience in wedding photography? For me, it started very early on. Um probably in college we uh, so within my major we also had to take a few art photography classes and I had uh, studio photography and uh, location I had a location lighting class which was you know taking the studio out of the studio um, so for, uh, basically for 20 years since I was a teenager uh, I've been using off-camera flash so it's even during my newspaper days it was um, a big part of what I did because you know, you'd shoot assignments and it was all candid, but then we'd have an assignment where you'd have to go do a portrait of an athlete um, or a business owner, <clears throat> excuse me, of a frog in my throat um, and get creative with with lighting that way. Right. So it was it was kind of vacillating. It, it was very it's very similar to wedding photography in that it was like 90 percent journalism and candid. And then 10%, you would have an assignment where you would have to go get creative with flash or gels uh, or do something at nighttime where you had to break out the flash. Um, so I've been doing it almost since uh, since day one. That's cool. It then, just shows you what what your you know your profession really was the best grounding for you, wasn't it? Like the best foundation yeah. you could have had in photography because you're getting all the skills. Like you say, weddings is, is journalism in many ways, like for the majority of the day. But for you to actually have that ability or, or to learn how to use off-camera flash and flash before weddings is going to put you at a huge advantage when you start out, I'm sure. 
Yeah, I mean, that said, when I, I remember using it at the very first wedding that we shot, but we had it tethered to the camera with this cord that maybe stretched for like six feet. <laughs> it was, a, yeah, a TTL cord, yeah. which is how we started. <laughs> and and so, it was, yeah. I think, like circa 2007, 2008. Yeah. And now, I mean, what we can do with it now with the radio triggers and, you know, we, we love the environmental portraiture. So sometimes Jesse's like half a mile away being able to pop off the flash. And we definitely couldn't have done that the way that we started. Yeah. Now with that six foot TTL. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but having said all that, I bet that really set you apart at the beginning when you, you know, because I, I, I started in 2006. I wouldn't have had a clue about how to do anything like what you were talking about there with Flash at the time. So you must have really yeah. been, especially because that was just coming out of the film, the sort of like the, the film photography era when it came to wedding photography. So I imagine you were really ahead of the curve when it comes to using, uh, using Flash. Yeah. And I, you know, I, in college, I started on film. Um, digital cameras were around, but they trained us on film because they, at the time it was still considered to be important to have that groundwork. But I, I think I thank my lucky stars that I don't have to shoot weddings <laughs> on film because I would be so nervous, Not especially with off-camera flash, where you'd have to have light meters and all these things. That And some people use light meters with digital, but for me, it's you can see an instant result and then tweak as necessary. So it's like, there's no for me, there's no reason to to get too technical about it no no I, I agree i agree and i i hold my hands up there's no way i would shoot a wedding on film i just wouldn't i would never feel confident enough i'm not good enough to do that so i i take my hat off to anybody who did and to like yourself yeah. jesse who has actually shot proper work on film i think that's that's it's really important i think i've i've dabbled with film since but yeah i would never dare to to actually where anything mattered i wouldn't i wouldn't dare to shoot film so so fair yeah. play to anybody who has um, nerve-wracking for sure and, and again just to have interest when when you're using off camera flash obviously there's two of you which is which is really cool and gives you potential advantages do you tend to work as a team or do you very much yeah. sort of shoot solo almost even though you're both shooting together no we we definitely work as a team to the point where you know I've, I've had to have this conversation with planners when we're talking through the timeline and they're like well one of you can go shoot cocktails while the other shoots the portraits it's like that's not how it works you know yeah and and if we do it that way then they're not going to get the product that they're paying for um but i would say majority of the time um i i do hold the lighting uh so I'll hold the light stand, but I also work with a couple, you know, I talk them through some poses and especially, like I mentioned, if we're doing those environmental portraits and Jesse's really far away, there's a limit to how much you can suggest. But because we've been doing this for so long, I kind of have like for better or worse, we're in each other's heads. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that's a brilliant thing. It's really good. Again, it's yeah. another advantage. You, you know what each other's thinking and you know what each other's going to want right. as well, even without asking. Exactly. And even if I don't know exactly what he's looking for, I know like, okay, in situations like this in the past, here's what we've done. So I'm just going to run them through a couple of things. I'm going to chat with them so that while we're getting the lighting down, they're not standing there bothering Jesse, like, hey, what do we do with our hands? Um, you know, it's just, it, it, I think it makes for a much better experience for our couple. And that's really, you know, the the pinnacle of what we're, we're going for is we want them to enjoy it, even if it takes us a little bit of time to like dial in the lighting and really perfect that shot. Because I mean, I think at the end of the day, we are perfectionists and we are going to, I mean, we could probably shoot the same shot for a really long time trying to get it perfect. So, you know, making that seem like it doesn't take any time at all with the couples is is a big part of giving us the chance. To yeah. That. And that's for portraits. But for other parts of the wedding day, getting ready, oh, yeah. we're doing our separate thing with our separate systems on different channels. So we're not popping each other's lights off. You know, she's Maura does all the bride prep. She usually starts about three hours before me because the groomsmen take 10 minutes to get yeah. ready and they're yeah. sitting around hungover <laughs> looking at their phones on the couch. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but we'll be separate for that part of the day. Then we kind of come together if they're doing a first look and do the portraits ceremony. We're shooting separately. Mm -hmm. um, reception, usually we shoot separately until kind of that toward the end of the dance party more than needs a break because she's been working for 12 hours and she needs to go have a beer or meditate or yeah. whatever. And then I'll kind of finish out the day by myself typically. Have a beer, meditate, kind of the same thing, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Alcohol Especially after a few, it's definitely can be meditation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to argue with that. Um, brilliant. And, and just before we get into the images, I and mean, you're, you're going to be preaching to the converted with everybody who's watching this anyway, but what would you say are the main reasons that you do like to, off camera or flash off camera flash oh so many reasons i mean you know if you if you don't if you don't have flash skills then you're just falling victim to whatever the ambient lighting conditions are mm -hmm. um and it's not you know that's nothing against people who say that they're purists or natural light photographers or whatever there's some people that do wonderful work with 
ambient light alone. Um, I'm not that good with just ambient light. If the ambient light sucks, I, I don't really know what to do. And except for break out the flash, right? Um, it just it allows me to get so much more creative and um, and do so in a more kind of impressive and dynamic manner that that makes you know future clients look at it and say, whoa, I haven't seen something quite like that because there aren't a ton of people in our area who are, are really proficient with off-camera flash. There, there are some. Uh, but it definitely helps us to stand out uh, in, in our market, which is a good thing. Yeah. And I think that it's also um, a great way to alleviate the fears of our clients, because a lot of times people will ask like, okay, what's the best time for portraits? And then I have to answer them like, well, if we arranged your wedding day around the best time for portraits, it would feel really wonky and people wouldn't, you know, like you'd be missing out on spending time with your, your guests. And so, you know, and, and as we'll see in some of the photos, Colorado has really bright, harsh sunlight, especially in the middle of the day, especially in the summer and being able to say like, it doesn't matter if we're shooting on the top of the mountain at one o'clock in the afternoon, we know what to do. We can make your photos look amazing and dynamic and still like bring in that beautiful blue Colorado sky instead of washing everything out. That's actually like the perfect segue into the first photo. <laughs> it really uh, is. And let's yeah. do that. This is a great answers, by the way. I couldn't agree more. And uh, yeah, I, I think um, what you said, so true. And I love the point you made there more about sort of like, not not allaying their fears because they may not have had those fears, but certainly pointing out that that if we don't get great weather or or the perfect conditions, it's not a problem. Is right. is really good, and that will make them think, oh. But if the other photographer that we're thinking of can't do that, then what what happens? This, so I think that's a really great point. But yeah, let this is the exciting part. Let's see some of your incredible images. This, I think, actually, it, it's an absolutely stunning image. And I think this sort of plays onto what you were talking about there with the, those Colorado skies. And, and look at that landscape. Is this, I and mean, this is not even a photography question, is, is this relatively near to where you live? As the crow flies, it's only about 100 miles, but it takes probably three hours to drive there because there's no direct route through the mountains. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, it's the top of Steamboat Resort, which is a ski resort uh, in Colorado. And, and this is perched all the way up at the top. Yeah, it's absolutely stunning. I, and I would also say as well, from, from somebody who uh, like admires your work from afar, this is also what I would say, like it's a typical Jesse Morrill plant shot as well. You know, it's the, the vibrancy, the colours, the lighting is exquisite. It's very much, I would say, your signature style, this sort of image. So it will be really interesting to find out a little bit more about how you created this image. Yeah, so like we mentioned, uh, most of our portrait sessions on wedding days happen uh, in the early afternoon and we get 300 days of sun in Colorado a year. So it's typically bright overhead sunlight with no or very little cloud cover and no shade, like on the top of this mountain uh, with no shade to put the brides in. Um, basically, our uh, order of operations is we look up at the sun and see if it's a little bit closer toward one horizon or the other. Um, and it usually is. It's rarely directly overhead, even in the middle of the day. And fortunately, the sun was a little bit closer to that western horizon that you're seeing in the distance there. So basically, we we set up the couple to uh, so that the sun is acting as a hair light on them, right? So coming from above and slightly behind them, so that uh, you know we still have these really bright ambient lighting conditions, but it, the sun isn't directly hitting them in the face typically. So we have a little more shadow control over uh, what we're going to be lighting. And then I expose, uh, I start out with ambient alone. I don't even think about the flash at this point. Uh, and I expose for the highlights in the scene. So I don't want to blow, clip any of the whites, right? So I'm exposing to retain detail in the brightest thing in the frame, which in this case is the highlights on those cumulus clouds in the background. Um, and the tops of, of their heads, basically. Yeah, that's really good so, advice. I, I think because that's the thing. It's easy when you look at the end uh, the end result. It's easier for us to because you've got your settings so so good in camera. It's easier for us to forget just how traditionally difficult this lighting is. Because you're saying that you know that not only is it is the, is a you've got the sunlight, but that is really high sunlight as well. Which is I say oftentimes where we would be scared to use flash because we think we've got to overpower that light. And you've done such a good job of that here. Yeah, I appreciate that. No, no, not yeah, at all. I say that like, it's easy to in. think, you know what, when the light is this strong, let's let's forget the off-camera flash for now and let's, you know, let's wait a bit yeah. till later. But you're you're doing this in, in what I say is often seen as being the, the hardest of conditions, which I think makes it all the more impressive. Yeah, and for sure, and exposing um, 
for the highlights, basically, we're we're dropping the the subjects to silhouettes now, which you can see, and we have a BTS here. Yeah, that's cool. Um, so we're not we don't have any detail since I've exposed for the background, which is much brighter than them, right? They go to almost complete silhouettes. Uh, but then we want to bring them back into the frame. So we're going to bring in our off-camera flash. This was taken, I think, before the Magbox came mm -hmm. out. Um, and it was windy up there. So sometimes we want a lower profile modifier. We don't want, you know, more will sail away like Mary Poppins <laughs> with her oh, umbrella. Oh, yeah. Got yeah, yeah, yeah. Got you. On it's top of a mountain. Mountain. Super yeah. windy on top of these mountains. It's hot, windy, bright, dust in your eyes. It's like all the worst conditions. So in these situations, sometimes we'll use the Mag Beam, which... Um, basically gives it throws light over a distance so i also don't have to photoshop her out i can never stand a little further back mm -hmm. and it gives us an extra little kind of hard punch of light uh, a lighting style that i would sort of refer to as like tenebrism um, or chiaroscuro which is like italian painting mm -hmm. terms which essentially refers to a hard beam of light on a subject against kind of a darker background that's sort of the sort of the look that we're going for in these shots and it gives it kind of a little bit of a painterly look in, in the end i think or at least that's that's the yeah the, yeah the light on them is absolutely beautiful yeah it's really nice and that actually just brings you on to another quick question so i, sh I should have really asked earlier can you just tell us what equipment you both use on a wedding day not 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 everything but just like what cameras you're using and what what you actually typically sure. using for flash yeah um so we're on the nikon system mm -hmm. um and i would say my favorite just from the very beginning of the wedding day my favorite absolute favorite lens is the 35 for getting ready yeah um, and usually I like to travel pretty light uh, for the getting ready rooms because sometimes they're really cramped or there's a lot of stuff everywhere. Um, so I always bring one AD2, Godox 8200 on an eight foot cheetah stand um, with, and then in my backpack, I have the uh, corrective gels, um, some creative gels, uh, grids, and then I usually bring a sphere along with me. Oh, the, the Magmod. Cool, yeah. very cool. Yes. And again, the great thing about yes, Magmod, we who we're very lucky to have as a sponsor uh, for Flashmasters, is that their, their stuff is not only quick to use, but it's very small and portable, isn't it? Which is, I imagine for, yes. for times of the day like this, it's really useful. Yeah, and for for something like this, we have to ride up a chairlift to get up to the wow. top, right? So we can't have a, a roller case with, you know, big modifiers and, and stuff like that. We have to be able to carry everything in a backpack. Yes, yeah. Yeah, so that's pretty, you know, we try to travel as light as possible beginning of the wedding day, but for portraits, um, if we're not at the top of the mountain, our ideal setup is two 8200s, especially for midday sun, and then one of the mag boxes. Um, and that's only if we've got the space to use yeah. it and you know yeah. we're close enough where it's not a huge hassle. Because... And it's, it's both lights in the same Mac, in the same box, right? Basically, so that gives us 400 watt seconds and, and kind of double the power to sort of over, help overpower the sunlight. Um, this photo was taken before they had the, the mag ring, which holds the two 8200s. But also what that does is it allows us to maybe dial back the flash power a little bit and then get a faster recycle time. So we're not juicing, you know, one flash to, to full power and then, and then having it kind of overheat on us in the middle of the yeah, shoot. Yeah, of course. No, I mean, it's, it, it's, re it's really good to see like that these behind the scenes, it, it, it sort of brings these shots even more to life. And the great thing is you can see that there's actually looks like there's almost like very little that you need to do in post as well, because we can see from the behind the scenes, like it's, it's very, very close. Yeah, I, you know, it's um, I'm just kind of retouching the uh, the light stand out yeah. there, but like I mentioned, with the mag beam being able to throw that light at a distance, then I, I don't have to take more out of the frame, <laughs> which I do occasionally, right? If we're using a, a big soft box, we want the light really close for that kind of really soft, creamy look, but then I have to go in and, and uh, edit yeah. more out. It's cool. I must admit, I, I feel guilty saying this because I adore MagMod. However, I've never actually used the mag beam, which, and you're now making me mm. think, why have I not done that? Because I will do the opposite. I'll be taking two shots and compositing Moira for a bunch of word yeah. out. But your way is far better and far easier. So, yeah, it's cool to see that the, the mag bean can be used like that. Yeah, you do have to be very precise with it. Um, and I will be the first to admit that I'm bad at angles. <laughs> so, you get a bad stare um, every now and again from Jesse. Yeah. <laughs> there's a little bit of a learning curve there. Um, one of the things that I haven't done, but it's on my list, is I, I want to just attach a little laser beam to the top of the A mag. laser pointer. Well, yeah, yeah, the laser Great pointer. idea. And that way, it'll just help me know exactly where it's going. I'll have to tell yeah, Trevor about that, the mag laser. Really <laughs> yeah, again, the, the I mean, it's so stunning, this shot. Not only because of the scenery but the lighting is exquisite i absolutely adore it and i say what a scene yeah well and, and this is one too where um 
you know, the, the one that we were looking at before was full sun, very little cloud cover, you know, middle of the day. This was actually a little bit later in the day, uh, very cloudy day, which is rare for us in Colorado, actually driving up to this venue, it was foggy, which we never get. Um, and so we had these amazing rays coming down from the, the mm. clouds and, you know, like the idea is that, okay, if it's a cloudy day, then it's still, it's like a big soft box. It's easy to shoot in. Um, but we're still going to bring in off camera flash, even when it is a cloudy day, when it's easy to shoot in so that we can get a more dynamic image like this one. Yeah. And this is maybe just a hundred feet from a really popular wedding venue here close to Denver. Um, and you know, hundreds of photographers shoot there every single year and they always use just ambient and the, the work is great. It looks wonderful, but it all looks sort of homogenous and similar. Yes. Uh, so we'll get questions from people who have actually shot on this very rock promontory. Oh, where was that photo taken? I've never seen, and they're like, I've, I've seen your photos at the exact spot. Mm -hmm. And they're like, holy shit, yeah. that is the exact yeah. spot. <laughs> it's just that what we've done is we've taken the ambient light dropped it down about two to three stops, just like we did in the last one, right? Exposing for the highlights in the frame so as not to blow out those mm -hmm. rays and, you know, bring out that drama and color and contrast in the background and then bring in that flash from camera left at about nine o'clock here. I think it's the, the mag beam again mm -hmm. um, to add that punch of light, right? To bring out uh, the couple. So the difference between this behind the scenes shot and the next one is that we've dropped the ambient way, way yeah, down, right? Yeah. So to bring out that color mm -hmm. and then now bumped up the flash power to compensate for that ambient light going down. Yeah, and I think two things to say here. One, I think Magma are going to receive a lot of orders for the Mag Beam after people watch this this stream um, <laughs> because, yeah, you're, you're selling it so well. But also, this is literally, like we were talked about earlier in this video, this is literally the reason why off-camera flash is such a great tool to have up your sleeve, isn't it? Because you've transformed a scene. that, Like you said, you could have shot this with natural light and it would have been fine. It would have looked nice, but you've given it impact and, and vibrancy as well. And, and the couple now pop and you still retain those amazing sun rays which is virtually impossible to do if you were just using natural light because you'd, you'd, be, you'd have to choose who you're exposing for so this is literally i think the definition of why off-camera flash is such a good tool to have yeah i agree 100 percent. and uh, this might be a good time to mention we we will deliver some of that natural light stuff to the couple mm -hmm. uh right just to give them kind of two different looks we, we'll go into a scene like this and we'll take we'll start out with ambient and we'll get some of the more basic stuff and then looking at the camera and then we kind of finish off every portion of the wedding day by mm -hmm. trying to, it's like, what can we do? What, how can we push this further? Right. And this is like a perfect example of that where we did some of that ambient light stuff with the kind of light and airy blown up background. And then we're like, okay, but we also need to get something that's more of a mantelpiece shot that yeah. really stands out and that we'll be able to use for a portfolio. And then going forward, we're just not going to show the the boring stuff right to the to the world that's just for the couple yeah. Yeah. uh we're only going to pick out this one the one that we really kind of finessed and tried to make look interesting and that's the one that we're going to put on social media and and for our blog and website and all yeah that. so we curate very intense yeah and, and that for anybody watching i think what jesse just said is such good business and marketing advice when it comes to wedding photography so although they will take other shots you're being very very meticulous and careful about what you show to the world and your future clients and i think it's very easy to underestimate just how important that is so that's really great advice. I also love as well, I imagine seeing where Jesse stood here, that the bride actually may even be laughing at you there, Jesse. So I wonder, when, are you sort of interacting with them as you're shooting as well? Because the moment is beautiful between them two and it looks very natural. Like that's not a forced moment. So I was actually standing over there lighting and uh, I one of my jobs is to tell really terrible dad jokes. Oh, I love and it. I Could you give an example of us one now? <laughs> <laughs> is it too, is that putting you on the spot? <laughs> oh no, I absolutely can. Excellent. Um, well, did you hear about the fire at the circus? No. It was intense. I oh, love but... it. Yeah, it works. I bet so it works every ones. time. I'm trying to. Yeah. She has she has better favorite. ones than that. My favorite one of hers is. Um, do you know what the best thing about Switzerland is? No. Yeah, I don't either. But the flag is a big plus. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> This yeah. this is why you get these amazing shots. This is it. Yeah, it's not like the off camera exactly right. flashes. It's the dad jokes. <laughs> yeah, and it's she will work with a couple, not just yeah. the dad jokes, but you know, because a lot of these, a lot of the the best poses, we're not great at posing. We don't pride ourselves on being like very meticulous. Okay, turn your head here. Put your hand like this, forty five degree angle. Okay, perfect. 
the best portraits that we take typically typically are like those in between moments yeah. where they might not even know I'll be like okay it looks good I think we're ready to go and then they kind of let their guard down and then pop 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 I take a few more shots and then maybe one of those is actually better than any of the shots where we were intentionally posing them mm -hmm. uh, so I kind of look for those like little little you know smirks or, or laughs in between kind of when we're when we're whatever they do naturally in general is better than what we're going mm -hmm. to contrive yeah but so. that's nice because it's them isn't it? it it you can tell that they they are very comfortable in that pose and that's the main thing i think if you try and make it too correct or or too posy you lose the naturalness of it and that's what you've retained really well there yeah i'm sure they absolutely adore that photo it's, it's stunning moving on to and this one when i when I, when you sent this one over it was like whoa this again mm -hmm. what an, what an example of of why off camera flash is just so useful and also not during a portrait as well, obviously, something, you know, during a meaningful part yeah, of the day. Yeah, we sprinkled in a few moments uh, here. So for, for ceremonies, we have a lot of these types of venues in Colorado where, uh, you know, the background is significantly brighter mm -hmm. than the light that's falling onto the, the couple and the bridal party at the front, right? It's they're in shade and then it's and it's bright sunlight out back. So the, uh, the options here are to expose for the background and turn the subjects into silhouettes, expose for the couple and blow out the background. Uh, or set up lights, right? And basically shoot it the same way that we talked about shooting those midday sun portraits where we're using that bright ambient light. It kind of is a hair light or a backlight and exposing for the highlights in that and then bringing in our flashes to fill in the, the areas that have gone dark because of that um, that small exposure, right? Yeah. And when we're doing this too, um, typically we we like to feather the lights a little bit, which means... Uh, in, in that behind the scenes shot, you can see that there's a there's a light on the left hand side of the room and there's a light on the right hand side of the room. The light that's on the right is kind of it's not they're not both pointing directly at the couple. The one that's on the right is pointing to the left of the couple and the light that's on the left is pointing to the right of the couple. And this creates sort of a more even light spread across as opposed to having like a hot spot over here and a hot spot over here. And we'll usually use as long as we have enough juice in our flashes, we'll use uh, mag spheres on both to kind of um, not soften the light. It's, um, I think a lot of people think that the mag sphere is used for softening, but it's more of a, a diffusion tactic mm -hmm. to kind of spread the light evenly across, across the scene. So you're sort of reducing specular highlights and, uh, creating a more sort of even fall off in the, in the gradation from, from light to dark. Yeah. And that's what works so well here. It, it looks so natural because we don't have those hot spots. out of interest. What sort of flash power would you be using for, for this? Cause I imagine as well that the light you, you compete against here is very bright. This one was a little more diffused simply because it was the tail end of wildfire season. Okay. So oh, yeah, that's the, smoke in the yeah, air. Yeah, so there was smoke in the air, so the light wasn't as bright as it would have been. Uh, this was in, like, early October uh, a couple of years ago. And um, so I think with this one, we got away with 18200 on either side. But we've shot there, you know, in, in June when the sun is really bright. Um, and in that case, we double up. Uh, you know, just two 8200s in each stand, like Jesse said, feathered across so that we can really balance it out, um, you know, and, and capture that blue sky. Sky wasn't blue this time because of the wildfires, but whenever it's blue, you know, like so many people will hire us because they they see that color in the sky and they see it blown out in other photographers work and they, they want to retain that. Yeah, but in a situation like this, if there's only one light on each side, it's probably full power or at least half power just because you do need a lot of juice yeah uh based on how bright that back even though it's the sun it's not direct sunlight in this case it's still so much brighter than the foreground and you, you do need a lot of juice to yeah. kind of to kind of make them show up we did one nighttime wedding here after dark yeah New yeah Year's so Eve we one. did we did one where the ceremony was after like an hour after sunset it was almost totally dark outside kind of like blue hour and in a situation like that, it's maybe quarter power, one eighth power or something like that. We don't have to, to juice it nearly as high. Yeah, that's great. Th th let me just, again, say thank you for the, what you're explaining here. This is absolutely invaluable, to not just to me, but I'm sure to everybody watching. Um, yeah, the, the advice you're dropping here is is incredible. So so thank you again. Sorry, if you don't mind going back, just one extra point. Of course. Um, no, of course. With this. I think we hear from a lot of photographers that they're afraid to use off-camera flash during ceremonies because it's going to bother people. And I will tell you, I mean, we worked here, what, seven times last year? Not a single time did anyone come up and say like, hey, 
that's annoying. The, the couple certainly didn't, their parents, their wedding party, none of the guests. And I will tell you, the guests have told us a lot of rude things. So I assume they Yeah, they, they, would have, they, they, would have, they would have held back. Yeah, yeah. 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 But I, they're, I think they're, that, not, they're not coy. Yeah, it's, there's, I think there's an unnecessarily limiting fear there with photographers. And so I, I'd, I'd encourage anyone who has a venue like this where, you know, a lot of it is in shade, but then you have a background that you want to show up, you know, just give it a try. Yeah, yeah I, I would say, though, that we do edu we do kind of run this by the couple ahead of time. We sort of explain to them that, you know, to get this style and the, and the shots that they want us to get, uh, we are going to have to pop off flashes. And they're always they're always like, oh, 100 percent and do whatever it is that you want to do. Mm -hmm. And if anybody has any issues with it tell them that I'm the one paying the bill. <laughs> yeah, right? ex exactly. So. And I, I'm really pleased you brought that up, Maury, because I, I've had similar in the past when 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 I've run workshops and I, I show how I off I use off-camera flash for, for speeches, for example, and people have to say, mm -hmm. does anybody get, like, say anything? I say, in, in the... the the 10 years that I've been doing that, never once has it come up. So I think it's just something that often is a fear that exists within the mind of the photographer rather than reality. But it's a great point to bring up because a lot of people are, I think, a bit more hesitant. But like you say, the couples are hiring you because they know that you know what you're doing. Yeah, and another another one of your, again, I would say like your signature shots. So that, that sky is just yeah. incredible. Thank you. Yeah, we have uh, two kinds of sunsets here well, we in can't, Colorado. We can't take credit for this guy. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to. Okay. I more, called this one in More can take credit for this guy. <laughs> no, we have two kinds of sunsets here in Colorado. One is where it looks like the, the sky was just dimmed, like someone just turned off the lights. And then the mm -hmm. other end of the spectrum is this, where we get the, the crazy clouds, you know, like beautiful wave clouds, you know, sometimes the, the storm clouds that just are so vibrant as yeah. the sun dips down behind the mountains. And this happened to be one of them. We did a, an elopement in one of our national parks nearby um, and were able to get some of these amazing sunset shots for this couple. Um, but I think that this photo uh, is actually a really good example of where we place the light. Um, so when we're using off-camera flash, we want when it's coming from directly behind the camera, it's gonna look really flat. So we try to get it, um, I would say typically when we're starting a portrait, we'll have it at either three o'clock or nine o'clock, depending on, you know, where we, we need it based on where the sun is or mm -hmm. where Jesse can Photoshop me out of. And any, anyone not familiar with that clock face metaphor, mm -hmm. basically imagine yeah. the photographer at six o'clock and then the subject is in the middle of the clock face. We want our, our uh, lights to be around three or nine, which creates, you know, that sort of 90 degree yeah. angle. Yeah. Yeah. But then in addition to that, we also want to get it off axis vertically. So we try to get that light really high up. And in this case, we were doing what, you know, we, we term as boom lighting. Um, and Jesse frequently has to do this one simply because he's taller. <laughs> <laughs> and I am like, I'm very short and usually can't get it high up enough, but this is where it's basically coming from like directly over. Um, and I would say Christian Cardona is, a, he's a master. He's at the master at the, uh, the overhead lighting. Yeah, yeah. Again, I'm really pleased that you brought this up because it's something that I've noticed through, through like looking at your work that you, that it's something I haven't done, but it's maybe think I really want to try this. Cause I think, I think it's relatively, I don't think it's something that, that many photographers do, but the way you do put your light up high and shoot down, like, it it gives you this really lovely lighting that I think we're not used to seeing, and and it's very dramatic. I love the contrast of it, and it's very punchy. So yeah, I, it's something I you've you've you definitely inspired me to try something similar because that's not where I would yeah. have my light, but I love it. Well, I, I wouldn't I would don't, don't you copy us your work is no, incredible no, no. <laughs> is if you take anything we have to say I'm sure that that can only uh, damage what no you've way no we'll, we'll 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 definitely agree to disagree with that okay no but um, yeah with this one um and if you look at the behind the scenes too um so the interesting thing about doing this kind of boom lighting is that and really any kind of this off-camera flash is oftentimes the difference between the you know a, a good photo and the best photo is just it's millimeters so the light here uh you know jesse was holding it when you're holding it like up like that you're you're not standing perfectly still you know we're human we're moving it around a little bit um and i'm just taking photos the whole time because we want to find the confluence of where the light is perfect and the expression is perfect yes you know and, and that's what we got with the other one you can tell based on this one and then the the image that we delivered the light's different but we're looking for, you know, not only the moment, but that nice, like, 
painterly ethereal look yeah and and like she said that is just a kind of a game of millimeters where you know i'm sort of making micro adjustments as as i'm holding the flash i don't know exactly where it needs to be right because i'm not seeing from the camera so i'm holding it and kind of tweaking it moving it closer feathering a little more bringing it out here bringing it over top down the entire time she's shooting because you can see there is a very stark difference between the light in this final image part of that mm -hmm. is editing of course um and the last one where that was kind of at the beginning where we had just gone in and and uh, before we made those micro adjustments so mm -hmm. the moral of this story is if your light isn't looking great you know don't get discouraged because you're probably not that far off mm -hmm. you're probably just one or two little micro adjustments away from from nailing it you don't have to reinvent the wheel and scrap it all and set up completely different uh different setup uh you just need to to work massage it a little bit yeah, right yeah like totally. chip away at that block of wood until uh the you know it starts to reveal itself again this is fantastic advice because what you're you're obviously saying there as well is that you're critiquing as you go you know you'll be taking a shot you're looking at what you're taking you're then <laughs> making those adjustments and then and then again doing that and i think that's often something that many photographers it can become scary using off camera flash and you feel like oh i've got to get it and if and if you do take too many then you've you know you've, you've got to move on but i love the fact that you're obviously making those micro adjustments by looking at what you're taking you're obviously breathing take a breath look at what you're taking what can be improved and doing it that way and i think that is that shows experience and, and that's where you'll get you know such good results by by taking the time basically to to not worry about taking shots again and get it right and, and thinking we're just going to change it a little bit well this also really highlights how much of a partnership it is when we're doing this mm -hmm. too um, because it's, it's not like, you know, we're just pulling in some rando off the street and saying, here, hold the light who doesn't know what they're doing. You know, we, we've both been on both sides of the camera. We yeah. both held the light. We understand. And, and the lighting can be difficult. You know, like Jesse said, he, he's not seeing the back of the camera, you know, so that can be a tough one, but being able to like continue, like keep at it, even without that feedback is really helpful because it, I think this always works best when we're both really engaged in what we're doing and making these portraits like a very concerted effort between the two of us. Yeah. yeah. And for anyone out there who has not spent time working the light, you know, I would encourage you to do that is uh, basically because then you, you, you see it from a different perspective and you, you can sort of empathize now with what it's like to be the lighting tech mm -hmm. or the lighting assistant, whatever term you want to use. Um, if you're only ever behind the camera, you're not able to kind of speak that other language. So spend some time, you know, spend some time modeling in front of uh, for an another photographer. Mm -hmm. If you have friends in your in your town or uh, or lighting for them, because I think it's a really good educational uh, process. So, yeah, that's a, a, again, a really good point. It's like when you are on the other side of the lens, you'll you learn different skills, won't you as well? So uh, the huge advantage of working together um, and that that is just comes through the, just the way you're talking, your images, how you are working as a team to create these great results and and the other thing just before we move on to the next image is it's easy to, to forget that all these incredible shots that you're showing us they're taken with one light as well oh sorry the ceremony one was obviously two but these portraits just one light so you're not needing these really complicated setups i used to create very dynamic looking images we always like to work in the simplest way possible um, you know, we want to make sure that we, we trust our gear and that we are not worrying about too many things at once because we found that that helps free up your brain to get more creative. Yeah. And we frequently have to hike in Colorado That's to true. get to these locations, you know, <laughs> so we can't, like I said earlier, for the shot on the mountain, we had to ride a chairlift up. Sometimes we have to hike miles, you wow. know, up thousands of vertical feet and you have to pack lightly. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so I think just by necessity, we use one light, but also like Morris said, it sort of simplifies, um, you know, kind of like some people will just shoot at one focal length or just shoot with one lens all day. Um, shooting with one light, I think it sort of paradoxically frees up more creativity because you're not spending so much time tinkering around with the, with the tech part of it and you have more mental bandwidth to kind of focus on the creativity and you're yep. forced to like really get to know what you can do with it right like you run it through the ringer and you you know like i can do this but here's kind of where the limitation is and then you have to think like how do i work around that limitation and yeah so it, it definitely operates a, a different part of your brain that i think you know not only can help you get more interesting images but also personally keeps me interested in what we're doing you know yeah like I, I love that and it's true it's like you're becoming a master of one light rather than like a jack of all trades of two three four yeah. like you you're yeah. really knowing what you can do with that one light and it, and it shows 
Um, yeah, absolutely beautiful. Again, this, a, a good example, because again, it's always easy to fall into the trap of thinking off-camera flashes for portraits, but it's not. It's for any part of the day. As you demonstrated earlier with the ceremony photograph, this, again, absolutely stunning, but obviously a real moment that's non-posed. Yeah, and for this one, you know, I've um, kind of like we mentioned earlier, I'm getting the safe shots first. This is the father-daughter dance. Uh, I get, I'm, and it's only you know, maybe of three minutes or something like that. So I'm getting some safe shots, um, but I already have a CTO on my flash because I want to balance the light from the flash uh, with the incandescent light coming from that chandelier above uh, mm -hmm. above the bride and her dad there, right? Because that chandelier light is really orangey and the flash is bluer. So now I'm putting that CTO color temperature orange gel on the flash to match that. I'm dialing my white balance from 5,500 Kelvin down to around 3,000 Kelvin. Uh, and then so for this shot, when I step out of the room and into this sort of atrium breezeway area that's being lit by the kind of late, is this blue hour? I what do you say? It was close to blue hour. It was like an overcast day, but the color temperature of that ambient light coming in from outside that's lighting up this wall here is a lot cooler in temperature now than my flash with the CTO, uh, which is which shifts it to this kind of bluish color. And, and you know, it's tweaked a little bit in, in post-production, obviously, but yeah, just a different way of looking at the scene, you know, mm -hmm. after getting those safe shots and then maybe kind of stepping back to kind of, to frame in the uh, the mother over there on the left-hand side. And, yeah, you know, no, I, I love it. It's a brilliant example of how you can change the scene with a CTO gel um, because it'd be easy to, to look at that and think, oh, have you lit the outside with a blue gel? But it's obviously not that. It's done in camera. Um, and then conversely, you've, you've obviously warmed up the couple by using that CTO gel. But what a brilliant example because it's that, it's again, it's the vibrancy, isn't it? Like that the color, the, the contrast between the warmth and the cool, the outside, in the inside is really lovely and i love that your composition the way that you frame them within within that window is really really lovely and again there's a moment there and that's always easy to overlook when we look at these shots to overlook the importance still of the moment that you're, you're shooting. Uh, it's like with the, even your portraits there's always a moment going on between the couple and i think sometimes it's easy to get wrapped up in the technical and it's getting the shot correct technically and forgetting about that moment but but i love how you you don't do that you know you're injecting the moment into that shot and it's really really nice i think what we'll do at this point if you don't mind jesse and Maura, for anybody who's watching this on youtube uh, what we're going to do is we're going to finish the video there we're going to say a huge thank you for sharing so much information with us i mean in 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 this video you have shared so much and it's been invaluable not only to me i'm sure to everybody watching so i say if you're watching on youtube we're going to say thank you if you do have any comments please do let us know um just below i would love to hear what you think and also please consider subscribing to us um if you haven't done so already but the big news is if you are watching this video in our flash masters community and there is a link below to join then jesse and mora are going to very kindly show us how they created these images so again, Jesse and Maury, thank you so much for, for sharing so much with us. We will continue this chat now, if that's okay, in our Flash Bastards community. But to everybody who's watched on YouTube, thank you very much for watching. And I will see you next time.